four million years later. Thank you for downloading and listening to the Four Million Years Later podcast, the show where a couple of friends get together and watch an episode of the original Gen- Generation One Transformers show and then get together and talk about it. My name is Jersey Droz. I am a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is... I am Hoover, and I am back. Yeah, and the show is back. Uh, not the, the podcast, but the Transformers series is back after the first three episode miniseries this is the first episode of the first season as it were so episode four and episode one right Mm-hmm. this has become a regular thing now so it's not just a three-part little movie type deal this is a i believe at the time i think at first was a weekly show i think it was on like maybe sunday mornings or something depending on where you live because they only had 13 episodes to fill out the rest of the season that was my experience with it was it was I watched this season. It was Saturday mornings and it was on at 7 a.m. If I am not mistaken, mm. I, I do remember this is the first cartoon that I set an alarm for. Hmm. Um, wow. Like I got up. I got up early on Saturdays like most kids did and watch Saturday morning cartoons. But like I would sleep in at least till like eight or nine. But when I found out that this was airing at 7 a.m., I think I don't I don't think I was looking at the TV guide or anything. I think I just came across it one week. I just happened mm. to be up earlier. And I was like, oh, wait, look at the clock. What time is it? Because. <laughs> the, yes, we could we could go into a whole Gen X or think about like back in our day you had to watch things when they're on TV. Yeah, we know, <laughs> but we did. So like you know you paid attention to the clock when you would catch things on TV. So I remember the following week I set the alarm and I'm like, okay, you know, because it would be Transformers and right after that I think was Spider Man and his Amazing Friends. Mm, good combo. It was a good combo. A lot of firsts in this first episode of the new season. Optimus Prime changes. We get to see the Decepticons underwater base and the sort of elevator that rises out of the ocean Mm. so the characters can go into the the base. Mm -hmm. That becomes like an iconic thing in the the next season or two. We also get to meet Gears a little bit more, (laughs) one of your favorite characters. And this is the first time when Spike and Bumblebee like really become buddies. Ah, Uh, yep. All happens in this episode. So... It's not, I wouldn't call this one like a super memorable episode for me, but as I watched it again in preparation for the show, it's like, wow, yeah, there's a lot of stuff happening like that becomes like a regular thing on the series after this. Mm, yeah. I'd be interested to learn like how far away was the recording time? Like how long ago had they finished episode three mm-hmm. when they were starting episode four? I, I don't really have any knowledge of the time difference between episode three and episode four and how long that was between they finished and wrapped up the miniseries and they got greenlit to series and like how long was it before they came back to do this that's something that might be a little hard to research but uh that would be interesting interesting to know but i would also wonder if even if it wasn't that far apart these voice actors and writers were working on so many shows at once right mm -hmm. so I mean, uh, I remember seeing David Kay at a Transformers convention ages ago. This is like between season one of two of Beast Wars. It was at BotCon 97. And somebody asked him like how he switches modes between characters. And he says that he comes up with like a sort of like a a line that epitomizes the voice for him. And so mm-hmm. he said for Beast Wars Megatron, it was maximal scum. <laughs> he said like he, the moment he says that he can get into the character's head. <laughs> but when you're doing, you know, characters in the order of a Frank Welker or a Peter Cullen, like that many between shows, right? Because he was doing like Wheeling and the Chopper Bunch and all these other uh, <laughs> cartoons at that time. Like, how do you keep all of them straight in your head? And do you remember what you were thinking at the time when you recorded, like, say, two months ago? So, yeah, Optimus is like, I, that's the biggest thing I notice is that we switch from, you know, early 30s Optimus to middle-aged Optimus. Yeah, he had a birthday the voice in between. <laughs> he did. <laughs> he really did. Um, so, but, the, but some things remain consistent with the original miniseries in that this episode and a lot of the episodes in this, this first season begins with a Victor Caroli intro. Yeah. I like whenever that happens, I, I've noticed it even happens in, into season two. Mm. They'll like occasionally a uh, show will just start, but occasionally other times he'll sort of like set the scene, whether mm-hmm. it's about the characters or the situation or, or what, but I like that this voice has been almost like duct taped to the concept of Transformers. Like he's part of the overall package. He's not a character, but he's this very iconic voice that's all wrapped up in Transformers. And he's a very serious voice. Like he's Mm -hmm. almost like a movie trailer narrator voice. Yeah, Um, yeah. 
which we talked up in previous episodes about how this series, one thing I didn't realize after all these years of talking about it until we started talking about it on the show is that it's comparatively speaking to later iterations of the show, it's very humorless. Mm. I wouldn't say it's not dour, but it's it's serious mm-hmm. and it's taking itself seriously. And I think having this guy with this voice coming in, right. factories are creating weapons to stop evil. You know? Uh huh. Yeah, he's very very much setting the emotional tone. Yeah, and then it and then the episode even starts with the uh, heroic Autobot theme with the the big uh, timpani drums, bum 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 bum, dun 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 da da da. Uh, again, this is like a thing I love about the first season soundtrack is like there's this iconic uh, like Wagner esque John Williams esque like you know when you hear that theme Optimus is gonna walk on screen at some point <laughs> then when you hear the dun 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 mm-hmm. dun you know Megatron's gonna walk on screen right, right? <laughs> so like there's there's a lot of like visual and auditory shorthand that the series does I think really well but. So where did we leave off? Uh, the Decepticon ship had crashed into the ocean. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Autobots were had eight oil tankers plugged into the Ark so yeah. they could go home. Spike and Sparkplug were to go to Cybertron with them, and then Megatron swam away. Yep. So. <laughs> so that brings us to Episode 4, Transport to Oblivion, written by Bryce Malick and Dick Robbins. So different writers... And the summary of this episode is basically Shockwave creates a new space bridge to transport the Decepticons back to Cybertron, but it's dangerous. To test it out, the Decepticons capture Bumblebee and Spike. Dun dun dun. Shockwave is back! We haven't seen since episode one of the series. Yeah. But yeah, but we begin with Victor Crowley telling us about these living robots who have landed on Earth called Autobots. Autobots. And as he says it, Optimus walks into the frame and he looks amazing. <laughs> um, and and uh, another thing that changes is this is where like the iconic head that we all think of his helmet design like really solidifies. Like before this, his helmet design was kind of like here and there in the, in the first three episodes. I don't, mm. If you watch closely, mm-hmm. they play it fast and loose with the design a little bit. Sometimes mm. it's thinner, sometimes it's rounder. But now it's the boxy thing that we all think of when we mm. think of this character. Again, which one of us is the artist, kids? <laughs> so obviously the art got gassed up and the Autobots could leave Earth so certainly the Autobots uh-huh. are back on Cybertron now and Mirage is living in a big hologram house and starring in the latest episode of Cybertron Cribs right? That is a reasonable assumption if you watched <laughs> the first three episodes carefully but instead we just have Optimus standing outside of the Ark which is still on the mountain and he's standing underneath this rock that is shaped curiously like a Decepticon seeker <laughs> in robot mode. Just he's like standing there like watching the sunset, which I think is actually kind of nice. I yeah. like to think of Optimus actually enjoying himself once in a while. Very pleasing to my optic sensors. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, he, he was a librarian before this. So like the, the man should have uh, some sense of like poetry and beauty deep down someplace in his soul. But yeah, he's standing there and we introduce him. And then what happens? Well, remember Cliff Jumper, guys? Remember Cliff Jumper, who was such a great sniper that he had Megatron dead in his sights, and then he fired and didn't come anywhere near Megatron? Well, yeah. <laughs> Cliff Jumper proves his vision is still just as good because he comes out of the Ark where he lives <laughs> every day and sees this silhouette that he thinks is a Decepticon! And he has his pistol on him, so he shoots what he thinks is a Decepticon. It's really just rocks. Yeah. And the rocks, little debris falls onto Prime and Ironhide, who are standing below. And Cliff Jumper looks like an idiot. So what you're telling me is that in your fanon, there would be a Mark Brown book called Cliff Jumper's Eyes, where he <laughs> learns to go to the optometrist. <laughs> uh, deep cut. <laughs> and then Gears makes fun of him, but at the end of the episode, Gears finds out he needs glasses and he puts on movie star glasses anyway. But yeah, so like the, the, he's, he, he's like, oh, I'm sorry. It sure looked like a Decepticon. And this is more in service to just have Ironhide say, yeah, well, we put them at the bottom of the sea months ago. Yeah. So it's like the Autobots got all the nations of Earth who all agreed on one thing for the first time forever. Mm-hmm. They got the governments to gas up their ship, and then they didn't leave. <laughs> What's going well, on? <laughs> well, I mean, but the ship was buried in a volcano, so like it's entirely feasible that they were having trouble like repairing the ship and like 
a speedy manner. Cause right, like, because seems... Haller's still across the sea over in the UK <laughs> living it up. That's right. They had no He's, architect yeah. to help them pull a ship out of volcano, so I guess that's He's why. drinking wine, eating cheese, and saying life is not sweet. <laughs> but... <laughs> But but no but I mean like I, I'm serious though like there are scenes where we see Spike walking through the arc in the first miniseries where like there's rocks projecting through the floor and the walls right like the mm. ship is pretty torn up in there like it hit the mountain so hard it killed everybody inside so it's just possible that like they were like yeah we gassed up your ship you ready to go home and Optimus like have you looked at our ship <laughs> this is gonna be a while before we put it back together and and it just so happens in this episode. They discover Megatron's back, which would stop them from going home. Sure. Maybe not Mirage from going home, but it would stop Optimus from going home. (laughs) Yeah, so Ironhide scoffs at the mere mention of Decepticons as he thinks they're deader than the Max Steel's Roboforce toy line became the second Transformers hit the shelves. You're baiting me, and it's not going to (laughs) work. Because I don't, I don't need your approval to to justify my love of Max Steel's Roboforce. Everybody's Uh, hugging. It, it was a crushing action, to be specific, <laughs> especially the bad guys. Maybe the good guys hugged, and actually, I wouldn't be against that if I were to, uh, you know, pursue my own fan. And there might that might actually happen there because sometimes people who act the worst need our help the most. <laughs> <laughs> but Roboforce is pretty great, and if you haven't watched the one episode cartoon made by Sunbow, if I'm not mistaken, it's worth watching uh, to see like a sort of like a fast forward version of an introduction to a toy line. It's like everything that the G.I. Joe and Transformers miniseries is do, but it's like in 30 minutes. So They all hug in it, right? Um, if it's anything like my Fanon, yes. Then yes, I, but I don't remember for sure. Um, <laughs> okay, I, I, I concede. Robots that are shaped like trash cans and have special hugging action, those are way cooler than a robot that turns into a Lamborghini Countach or an F-15. Well, and I'm just saying that there's room for all kinds of robots in the world inclusivity how about that (laughs) this podcast is woke (laughs) so but going back to optimus ironhide says like the decepticons are gone for good and this is where we get our first clue that optimus is not the same optimus whatever happened let's see the original miniseries he ended with his like angry prime (laughs) right and then there's like a couple months and now all of a sudden he's like way more mature because it's like the Decepticons are gone for good. Right, Optimus? And he's look Optimus is looking down at the ocean. He's like, I wish I could believe that. It's like, okay, he's haunted now. Now he's like always worried about Megatron. Mm-hmm. He's like, maybe we should have actually looked under the sea instead of, you know, just assumed they were gone. And then we go under the sea and Megatron is always ready to tell you exactly the situation <laughs> when you walk into the room. Unfortunately, Trailbreaker or Hound weren't listening in at this point. <laughs> but I, I just like to think of it as like, this is something he does for politeness. Like if you walk in the room, he'll be like, oh, Thundercracker Skywarp. I was just telling Soundwave. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, like, he brings everybody up to speed. <laughs> so we see Megatron. Oh, well, first we see the base and the base is, uh, well, it's rather their crashed ship mm-hmm. in the bottom of the ocean, which is not nowhere near as banged up as the Ark. But there's more than down at the bottom of the sea. And this is what I love about doing this podcast is that I'm looking at the series with a different sort of eyes now. I mean, I can't tell you how often I've watched, especially these season one episodes, I've watched them a lot. But still, Mm. it's like there's things that I've seen that I've known that like part of my brain didn't tell other parts of my brain that I saw and knew these things, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's like I noticed for really the first time that there's like a whole city block of buildings around their ship down at the bottom of the sea. And it's like Mm -hmm. this was just a spaceship that crashed into the sea, quote unquote, months ago. But now Mm -hmm. there's buildings on the ocean floor just all around it so it's like why are these necessary did they all just get tired of of living in the ship and they each wanted their own house so they all just built themselves their own house like there's a decepticon block party going on under the sea it could be that they were building laboratories they were building uh individual crew quarters i like that like what i like about your premise is that you're questioning this fact that why would they need other rooms well do you think the decepticons all just sit around in one big room like a clubhouse (laughs) (laughs) Well, I imagine that 
as we've sort of stated, I, I don't think Thundercracker or Reflector have a lot of buddies amongst the Decepticons. <laughs> so I would imagine that once they were down there for more than 10 minutes, they were like, okay, we need to get these guys their own places to live. <laughs> I mean, I imagine that they do things other than stand around and argue about the best way to kill Autobots, right? Like, I'm sure that because like later on we get to meet like Decepticon scientists and stuff, so I'm sure there's you know like Soundwave's got to have like a place to do planning for new new patented uh, technologies and mm -hmm. he's got to build more purple jets to come into being <laughs> later on, or in the case of this episode, more Starscream colored jets, <laughs> <laughs> which we'll get to. But but anyway, yeah, it, and, and like this is raising two interesting things for me. One is like, yeah, these guys work fast, and they worked fast in the first mini series. Oh, yeah. right? It's like Soundwave pre prepare plans for a new space cruiser, and then literally like six minutes later, the <laughs> space cruiser's half built. <laughs> but in in this show, it's like a couple months later, they've built a small compound around the spaceship. So it's like they work fast. But the two is like, well, why not just build a new space cruiser? But okay. Uh, I, I, you know, maybe Megatron's figuring like I need to stay here and get even more energy before we can even think about space cruisers. I don't know. Yeah, but I think they're just having too much fun having block parties down there under the sea, under the sea, and reflectors yeah. taking uh, drunken pictures of the rest of the Decepticons and maybe trying to blackmail them. I don't know. Which that's not. I mean, like you joke, but that's not inconceivable because, like, when we get to later on into the episode called Microbots, we do mm -hmm. find out that it's, they, Transformers can be intoxicated, which is weird to put in a kids' show. Mm -hmm. So weird. <laughs> I remember uh, back when uh, the first cartoon was airing on the Hub Channel. I was uh. at one of my friends' houses, and we happened upon it, and I said, "Oh, this is the episode where the Decepticons got drunk," and they sort of chuckled. And then a few minutes yeah. later, they realized I wasn't making that up. I wasn't being funny. That it's was the such a actual strange thing. thing that happened in the episode. Yeah, yeah. Like, there, there's, there's. Well, we'll get to a lot of problematic elements of the series as we progress through. But like, that's one of the ones where it's like, as a kid, I thought it was really funny. As an adult, I'm like, eh, is that appropriate? I don't know. That's kind of mm -hmm. weird. It's a strange thing to put in a kid's show. But then again, you know, I think that there's room in kids entertainment for all sorts of things, which we'll also talk about when we get to some like the scarier episodes. But um, but anyway, yeah, so there's a city down here, and then we get inside the base, and then Megatron has that line that says, oh, you just got here? Well, this is what I was talking about. He's like, the Autobots think we're dead, but we're alive. <laughs> <laughs> in case the rest of you Decepticons thought this was some sort of weird afterlife thing, no, we're yeah. alive. <laughs> yeah, you think this is what Decepticon purgatory looks like? No, it's actually not. We're, we're alive and kicking. <laughs> It was Decepticon Purgatory until they got Reflector and Thundercracker their own houses. Their own houses, yes. And they're standing there gossiping about work. And so, what what's happening here? Um, we is this where it cuts to Cybertron? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, which we haven't seen in four million years in Showtime. Yeah. So, hey, guess what? It's still there. Megatron was right when he and uh, Skywarp were talking a couple episodes ago, and Skywarp was like. How do we know Cybertron still exists? Megatron just said, it must exist. I told Shockwave to leave it like I left it. And he literally did keep it how Megatron left it because we see that shot and it's, I think it's the exact same painting from the very first episode with like the, you know, the gored planet with like a little bit of light coming from its core and in some of the buildings. And then we zoom in and we see Shockwave in gun mode, space gun mode. And he's like shooting. Is that what he's doing? It looks like he's shooting. <laughs> It does look like he's shooting at something, but what that is, who knows? Uh, maybe he's just, I don't know, doing something that looks like shooting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, because it's its like a weak laser, too. It's like, pew, 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 mm -hmm. pew, And then he's like, oh, my God, I'm so tired. And he transforms back into robot mode. Well, Megatron told him to keep it like he left it, so he w hasn't been allowed to change any of the batteries. No. So the batteries <laughs> have just been dying for four million years. It makes you wonder if, like, there was a scene that was in there where he was actually firing on, like, renegade Autobots or something. Because, like, it just... Female like, Autobots. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm uh, anticipating getting to that one and, <laughs> and, and really navigating some difficult things that they put in that episode. But, <laughs> uh, but, but, like, yeah, he's like, I have to wonder if there was something that got taken out because it's just such a strange transition to cut to him in gun mode shooting. And then I get it that they're saying, like, oh, he's almost out of power and they're showing it. Well, okay, but there's got to be another way to do it. Right. What is it? He's like, almost out of power. I got to call Megatron. <laughs> right? Yeah. Losing power. 
just trying to communicate with Megatron. It's our only hope. Yeah, so he's been there, presumably alone running the show, for four million years. Four mm. million years. Mm-hmm. And now these these guys live a long time. Mm-hmm. But But as far as we know, Megatron has not been in any contact with Shockwave since he left. And that was mm. four million years ago. And just in case you think we're reading into that, that it's just my personal fanon, well, how about this? Megatron, planet Cybertron to Megatron. Are you there, Megatron? It can't be. Shockwave, guardian of Cybertron. Megatron, leader of the Decepticons. And the future ruler of the universe. Report status. Our supply of energon cubes is dangerously low. But our new intergalactic transport system is almost complete. Excellent. We'll suck this Earth planet dry. Yeah, so the phone rings, the, the computer phone, and Megatron says, it can't be. Mm -hmm. Like, I am surprised. I'm surprised that Shockwave's calling me. So, like, he didn't have any intention of reaching out to Shockwave. Or if he did, maybe he called and he couldn't get a connection. I don't know. Like, there's a lot that's, that, that might have happened in the intervening months that we didn't know about. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, he's surprised that, he's, that, that Shockwave mm -hmm. is calling him. Yeah, he's either surprised Shockwave's still alive surprised that Cybertron still exists. We don't yeah. know, but he can't believe it's Shockwave on the other end of the phone. So that seems to tell us that they haven't spoken in four million years. Yeah, and, and Shockwave's been waiting this whole time. If he has been calling him, uh, he hasn't been getting through. But as far as we can tell, this is the first time he tried to call. But in yeah, your, in your head, he, he has been calling. What's really amazing to me about this is it's not... Megatron getting into contact with Shockwave. Megatron didn't initiate the call. Shockwave initiated this call. So it's Shockwave calling his boss, who he hasn't heard from in four million years. So how many times has Shockwave tried to call Megatron over the past four million years? I mean, right. uh, it, it just boggles the mind. <laughs> At least it boggles my mind. Other people have more important things to think about, but these are the kind of things <laughs> that keep me up at night. Well, we get some more hints at how Shockwave feels about Megatron in later episodes, but th their greeting to one another is also revealing, right? They're both very, like, it it's the warmest you ever see Megatron address any other Decepticon. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, Megatron is truly glad to hear from him. I mean, honestly, if someone was trying to call me for four million years and they didn't give up and stop, I mean, that is a very rewarding thing. So, ladies, get yourself a man who will still try to call you after you ghosted him four million years ago. <laughs> it's like Megatron saying, oh, you remembered the old man after all this time. <laughs> so, yeah, so they greet each other. and then, But there's, there's a hole in this theory that Shockwave's mm. been trying to call him the entire time because Shockwave specifically mentioned something that was invented on Earth. Yeah, it really seemed like Soundwave patented that whole Energon Cubes idea. But Shockwave knows what Energon Cubes are and says that Cybertron is really running low on Energon Cubes. So maybe when Soundwave sent Buzzsaw to fly back to that Cybertron patent office, Buzzsaw stopped in for a little chat with Shockwave. <laughs> or maybe Ratbat flew over. Of course, we all know Ratbat runs the patent office on Cybertron. Fanon. <laughs> Ratbat flew over to gossip with Shockwave. It's like, yeah, so guess who's still alive? <laughs> Yeah, so who knows? I mean, that's just a crazy theory. Okay, I need that jingle for well, my theories, people. Come on, let's let's <laughs> make it happen. It, it this is this is what happens when multiple people write a series, and you know, little details like that are gonna. Well, they talked about energon cubes in the previous episode, mm -hmm. so we're just gonna talk about energon cubes now. Yeah, you know, I remember as a kid being like a little bit wowed when I found out that the Autobots used Energon Cubes in uh, the Transformers movie, right? Like mm. when Optimus says we don't have enough Energon Cubes, I'm like, oh, the Autobots use them too? Because like you never see how the Autobots fuel up. So The most sinister thing about that is that Soundwave gets a little cut 
every time yeah. the Autobots use <laughs> Energon right. cubes. That's how you really gain superiority over your enemies, is you make them pay you royalties. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he was actually uh, backed by the Crimson Twins. That, that, there's, there's another crossover event that we can write. Soundwave <laughs> and the Crimson Twins, and like how they want to... How did the line of the file card go? Uh, they choke people with their own money. Um <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> so our intergalactic space bridge is nearly complete. It's like, oh, okay. So there's this new technology that's going to... So, so maybe this is... W- Megatron was working on a new ship. And then once Shockwave says space bridge, Megatron's like, oh, pff, forget the ship then. We don't need that. We can have instantaneous travel. That's even better. Yeah. So this is the first time we hear of this thing called the space bridge, which becomes a profoundly important piece of the uh, franchise, not only in this series, but later on, right? Mm-hmm. The space bridge was pretty important in Transformers Prime and the 2001 R.I.D. series. Yep. So, but then we go back to Earth after they, they do their whole like, okay, well, we're going to work together and make the space bridge thing happen. And we cut to, oh, it's a power plant. Isn't yeah, it's it? like a big power plant and it's run by men in hard hats because this cartoon <laughs> can only show us humans who all wear the same uniforms, hard hat and jeans and a tan shirt. Yeah. Well, I, okay, so I'm going to advocate for the artists. And, uh, you know, there's something about cartoons that I think is really lovely in that there's like, it's, it's visual poetry, right? <laughs> Does Shaggy wear the same clothes every day in Scooby-Doo? Of course he doesn't. But it's a visual shorthand to let us know that that's Shaggy. Baggy green shirt, you know, brown bell bottoms, and big black shoes, right? Well, actually, character-wise, I would not be surprised if Shaggy was wearing the same clothes every day. Oh. But, like, Velma and okay. Daphne. Velma or Daphne or Freddy, yeah. They, so I love this idea of, like, this is visual shorthand or visual poetry for working, you know, Joe Sixpack. Yeah. Hard hat, yellow boots. When you see those things, you know to think just run of the mill, everyday, workaday humans, right? <laughs> we because the show is for kids, and we don't have. There's no well. There's gonna be one nine year old who's watching. Who's like, oh, excuse me, that's not what people in power plants wear, <laughs> you know? But for the most part, we're just like, oh yeah, this guy's in a power plant. Well, they're working. They got hard hats and everything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there is something to be said for that. It also probably was just expediency. Just like take the bottle sheets from the last three episodes. Take the two guys that I don't understand it, Joe, you know, and like just ver- vary their faces a little bit, you know, because that's essentially what we got here. I don't think I've ever set foot in a power plant in my life, but is there a reason for hard hats in a power plant? Are Are there like <laughs> things dropping from the ceiling in power plants? I don't know. I, I don't know either, but I don't know. It's possible. It's possible. Like if you're working in any place where there's like big machinery, um, you, you, I've seen people like even in the Honey Bunches of Oats commercials, they're wearing heart hats for crying out loud. <laughs> and they wouldn't make anything up. I thought Apple Jacks was going to be the only cereal we would reference on this podcast. <laughs> no, there's a lot more. All right, so we get we go inside the power plant, and it's like a solar power plant, which is pretty cool. And then we go inside, and we see some guys working, and they're listening to the radio while they work. And this is an important piece of music they're listening to, right? <laughs> We're going to hear this music a lot over the next hundred and something episodes, right? Hey, Ed, turn your tape player down, will you? <laughs> okay, now before we talk about too much about this music... Yeah. Do you think this is the same Ed from Sherman Dam? Oh, that's right. So maybe Ed got a new job. <laughs> did and G1 after- actually do the R.I.D. green-haired girl before R.I.D. did it? <laughs> Ed <laughs> is just going from place to place, constantly getting interrupted by Decepticons no matter what job he takes. And like he got orders from his therapist that he should listen to music at work to calm his nerves <laughs> because he's so shaken from that last experience. Hey, Ed, turn that down. Oh, you know? man. Whole backstory here for Ed. <laughs> that's the other thing we do a lot when we talk on the phone. <laughs> so like he's like, oh, that's not my tape player, though. And then all of a sudden. <laughs> so w- w- this is part of Soundwave's like uh, phishing scam is that he like turns into a tape deck and waits for people to steal him. And so he's like kind of like, well, you deserve it. You stole me. <laughs> Sunrise got this weird set of morals that he uses to justify all of his actions. <laughs> like I'm going to stand out here, wait for somebody to pick me up, and then whatever happens after that, it's on them. They picked me up. They shouldn't have. <laughs> but like, and then also, like, who hit play on the player? If somebody brought him in there, right? And then somebody plays the tape, which is 
laser beak because he transforms and he ejects laser beak who starts shooting up the place so is that does that mean that's laser beak's theme <laughs> and you got to wonder like do do each of the little cassette guys do they have their own music that they play and they have like their own yeah. preferences like what if frenzy just plays exclusively classical music <laughs> yeah yeah Chopin. <laughs> so while they're shooting out the place and scaring all the workers to running out of there, then all of a sudden, like, a wall just, like, turns into goo and explodes. <laughs> yeah, Megatron learned uh, last episode how to make a great entrance, or maybe that was two episodes ago. Yeah, two episodes ago. So when he, he walks through the wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so basically the, the wall just melts, and in come Megatron, Starscream, and Skywarp. And they start using the plant to produce energon cubes. Yep. And he's still saying at this point, prepare the energon cubes. Mm -hmm. So, and then we see Soundwave doing the thing with his chest, making the weird boxes. And then like sort of like put, putting wires in the boxes. And then it just like turns into purple fluid upon contact with it. And then we cut to Spike, who is not riding in Hound. <laughs> yeah, he knows better since his ribs have been crushed. <laughs> yes, after the whole almost flooded your engine incident. Now he's like trying out a new friendship with Jazz, mm -hmm. who is not the second in command of the Autobots anymore. That idea has been thrown out. <laughs> you think he got demoted? Like, because I was like, <laughs> okay, let's look at everything that happened under your watch. That's right. That's there you go. Sideswipe took off. Performance review time. <laughs> Ironhide took off. You know, all this, all this stuff happened. Hound almost drowned. <laughs> Ironhide made a new river. The mayor of that town is still calling me. <laughs> Yeah, because like now Jazz is like he's he's carefree. He doesn't have to hang out at the base and like worry about rallying the troops or anything. He's just driving around with Spike and listening to the radio, and it's the same song that Laserbeak was playing. <laughs> wow, you picked up a great beat on your supercar stereo, Jazz. <laughs> you dig it, huh, Spike? Well, let me ramp up the decibels for you. Yeah, get down. Did it? Did it? Did it? Did it? Did it? So this music here actually debuted on Spider-Man and his amazing friends. And it's just part of like the Sunbow sound library. So that's why mm. you hear it used in GI Joe, you hear it used in Transformers, you hear it used in Spider-Man. It's just something they used for like party music. That's how it's used in the, in the episode <laughs> of Spider-Man and amazing friends. It's like a bunch of guys get together to party. Clearly this is what's <laughs> going to be playing in the background. Doesn't it also get used for like breakdancing scenes in Transformers mm -hmm. later on? Yep. Oh my goodness. Season two, oh baby. <laughs> oh, we get to one of my favorite pairings in the series, Raul and Trax. But, <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, th th as a kid, I mean, this was one of those things I noticed. Like, they're always playing the same song. What's great is that this song sort of has relevance to us specifically because back when we started talking, occasionally we would talk on the phone, but we would write mm -hmm. like long pen pal style letters to each other. And I remember one time we brought up this music and we had to like, neither of us know anything about like making music. So we had to like convey what music we were talking about. And mm -hmm. I just remember us writing die da, die da, <laughs> die da, die da, die da. That's right. To try to explain yeah. which one we were talking about and referring to. Yeah. And we both knew. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Like, oh, that yeah, that, that was like, <laughs> It was used in Autobop. It was used in yeah, uh, Transport to Oblivion and a couple episodes of G.I. Joe. <laughs> <laughs> so, but they're like, yeah, you know, they're listening to the music and all of a sudden it's like, oh, whoa, look out. There's a traffic jam. And this is like a weird, I watched this scene uh, closely. And this is the funny thing about like doing this, you know, for the podcast is like, like you said, I'm watching more carefully than I did in the past. Like mm -hmm. normally, I've watched this episode countless times, but usually when it's just like playing on a monitor at my art desk while I'm drawing. So I'm mm -hmm. really not watching. I'm just listening mostly. And this is one of those scenes where it's like I never noticed how how much it was tell, don't show yeah. until I looked carefully at it. Because like I'm just so used to hearing jazz saying, oh, it's Blackout City. And I got a picture in my head of what that looks like. Mm hmm but and it's not what it looks like on the screen <laughs> no it just looks like a traffic jam in the middle of the day you know but then they like show one quick cut of a traffic light that has no lights on it's like oh okay <laughs> so there's, there's no power everybody there's a traffic jam because there's none of the traffic lights are working so was, what is it like we gotta get back to headquarters and mm -hmm. then we, we go to headquarters and now we really get a taste of middle-aged optimus while mm -hmm. he's like 
almost whispering to himself as he's <laughs> searching uh, online with, with Teletran 1, right? This is not John Wayne Prime anymore. He's very calm, reserved. He's very, like, analyzing the situation all the time. Just sort of calmly yeah. taking it in. Maybe because Prow proved himself to be such a lousy military strategist, Prime's like, okay, well, clearly I got to figure everything out now. He, he demoted oh Jazz. He... Maybe he gave Prowl a new task. Okay, Prowl, you're the architect now. I don't oh know. Oh my gosh. You just you just hate the Autobots so much. <laughs> <laughs> Every one of them are failures in your eyes. <laughs> mm, is it my eyes or is it the eyes of any rational human being who watches this show? <laughs> Yeah, do do you speak for everybody or don't you? You do. No, but like Optimus is watching and he, and he does this line. He's like Megatron lives. You know, he's he's like uh, he finds the power plant. He's like, "Okay, so why is there power out? Teletran 1, you know, launch the sky spy, go look around and then it finds the power plant where it says zero power being emitted." And he's like, "Ah, there's there's the problem." And then they cuts like Teletran 1 somehow like gets inside the building really fast. And then we get this quick cut of Megatron standing in front of a hole in the wall in an action pose. And then Optimus leans forward like, "Oh, Megatron lives." I do remember I remember watching that as a young person and that line because he whispered is I'm like I'm like, "Oh my gosh, that's so scary." Like yeah. Optimus is scared, you know. Like anytime he emotes, I remember it really hit me hard. But like we don't get a whole lot of that from here on out. Like this is probably the most emotional he gets for like the next 12 episodes. <laughs> but he's like, "Autobots assemble," right? Yep. Uh basically Half the team is out on patrol, so we get very much a hodgepodge of characters who are here. Well, it's it's Gears, Cliff Jumper, and Prowl, and Ironhide, and Ratchet. Mm. And then, like at the last second, we hear Bumblebee come running up, and it's still the old footstep noise. I want to note for the record. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna be paying close attention to when it switches, and so I can you know, <laughs> mark it. For posterity, what is the moment they change the Transformers footstep noise? <laughs> we're going to get, a, we're, on the video edition of this podcast, we're going to get a Chiron that runs into your name, Jersey Droz, <laughs> Transformer footstep expert. <laughs> Transformer footstep historian. Uh, <laughs> but Bumblebee comes in. Bumblebee reporting for duty. Oh, and that charming Dan Gilbison voice. He's so sweet and so <laughs> cheerful. And he's so, he's so ready to help. But you know who's not sweet and cheerful? Yeah. Is Gears. Yeah. <laughs> and this is this line got so much traction with you over the years. Like I, I, you have mentioned this line more than many, many lines of the series when you're making fun of the Autobots. What is it about this line that you don't like? Well, it's it's mainly just gears in general because all the Autobots are they're helpful. They're generally heroic. Gears is the grump. Yeah. That makes yeah. it would make a good fanfic. Like, what if Gears and Thundercracker, you know, got trapped somewhere somehow, and like, oh, how like would they that. get along? I like that a lot. Like the Rick and Lisa in Robotech when they're trapped inside oh, the SDF one, yeah. transformed, and like they have to actually talk about their feelings. The old <laughs> trapped in a room, talk <laughs> about your feelings episode. Yeah. Uh, so Gears just starts complaining about all the Autobots, and Thundercracker starts complaining <laughs> about all the Decepticons, and they just start talking for so hours. They're so geeky. And then they finally <laughs> get out of the cave or wherever they're trapped, and then they say, "You know what? Uh, do you need a roommate?" <laughs> no, it would totally be like if it wasn't for this war. Yeah, I know. Well, see ya, and they both walk away, <laughs> like sad about the friendship that will never be because they're caught in a bigger, crazier world. <laughs> <laughs> but so I gears do like is that grumpy. Idea. Gears points out that yeah. Bumblebee's late again. Again, he's not just late; he's late again. And why maybe, does that bother Gears? Maybe what also is, Gears what's it to you, is Gears? angling for that uh, second in command position that's been vacated by Jazz. <laughs> yeah, so let us see that's on the cutting room floor is when he looks like cloyingly at Optimus after he says it. <laughs> You're late again, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I could do it. I'm a real taskmaster. I know you're not happy with the way Jazz did things, but man, oh man, am I detail oriented? <laughs> I don't. It is a weird line, uh, but I guess it's just to show that like Bumblebee is the least military of the group, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, but it's a weird line. And so they they head to the power plant, and they actually catch the Decepticons off guard. Starscream <laughs> turns around now. We got to talk about Starscream's or Chris Lotta's performance in this episode. He plays a slightly different Starscream than he does later on. Yeah, again, I, I would be very interested to know, like, how long has it been since Chris Lotta was in the last session for episode three doing that voice? Yeah, he's he's much more like 
Ivy League school kid in a John Hughes movie <laughs> in this one. Right? He's he's like uh like the bad guy from Pretty in Pink. What's his name? Um <laughs> I just know Ducky. Oh, <laughs> uh, James Spader's character in Pretty in Pink. Yeah, mm-hmm. he, he's he's much more like he's all, he's got like the vaguest remnant of a Harvard lockjaw in the way he's talking, but not really. Right, he's not doing Thurston Howell the Third, but he's just got like this this like sardonic kind of like my no, right? We'll take care of your squirming mm-hmm. for a while. You know, he's not doing the harsh, screechy star scream that most people think of when we think of the character, right? Mm-hmm. I want to say in like the first six episodes of the season, he alternates between those two quite a bit. Like I, it was enough that I noticed it when I was first watching the show. Like, well, which is he? Mm-hmm. But he turns around, he says, <laughs> Autobots, what, 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 what does the brave, courageous second in command of the Decepticons do? <laughs> Run for cover! <laughs> It's Gears and Cliff Jumper and Bumblebee. <laughs> I mean, Starscream has never really been the bravest of Decepticons, but I've also never seen him run at the side of three minibots either. Right. Well, maybe maybe he has anxiety. You know, like there's one thing that people with anxiety hate. It's it's surprises. And so he was surprised. <laughs> and so he, he he reacted. You know, not not at, at peak capacity. But Megatron, like it says, you know, stand your ground, Decepticons. And what's weird though is like Skywarp runs away with Starscream. It's mm-hmm. like it's like if you shout loud enough and with enough like conviction in your voice, Skywarp will just do it. <laughs> <laughs> like somebody says, "Do the duck dance!" really loud, and he'll be like, "Okay, fine." <laughs> anyway, Cliff Jumper runs in, and yeah, bold blind Cliff Jumper <laughs> runs right up to Megatron and bold, attacks him. <laughs> Hey, you can't fault the guy for being courageous, right? No. Like the whole he's playing true to his foul card. Let me at him. Uh yeah. strike first, strike fast, strike hard. But he runs up to Megatron and like punches him in the thigh. <laughs> <laughs> I like the shot of this because at first Cliff Jumper's in the foreground of the shot. It looks like he's actually like relatively the same size as Megatron, but then no, he approaches him and he gets a lot smaller <laughs> as he yeah. goes uh, as he goes away from the camera. Yeah, he enters the frame closer to us and seemingly like closer in parity to Megatron's size than as he runs into the shot we see him shrink away <laughs> and we see that Megatron's they do a forced perspective trick where Megatron's just really far away mm. and then yeah he he's like he's not even to Megatron's waist yeah and he yeah he still punches him like yep. that's like that's amazing but he doesn't do anything he's just like bunk and then Megatron like just swats his hand and Cliff Jumper <laughs> goes flying across the room Again, I mean, Cliff Jumper could have thought he was just running up to uh, an outcropping of rock or something. Yeah. Get some glasses, Cliff Jumper. <laughs> Cliff Jumper's Eyes by Mark Brown. So the fight, this, now we get to, and this is something I want us to make a note of as we progress the series. This first season, first miniseries and the first season, the fighting is much more imaginative in this show than it gets later on mm-hmm. later on like by, by the mid season two it becomes literally them hiding behind rocks and just shooting at each other yeah and sometimes not even hiding behind rocks sometimes just basically like all the autobots are standing in a line and all the decepticons are standing in a line and they're like <laughs> half a mile away from each other and they're just all shooting yeah 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 it gets progressively less imaginative as time goes on but in these first episodes like there's it's really exciting i mean this is one of the reasons that I set my alarm because when the fight scenes would happen, it was they clearly were thinking a lot, a lot about choreography and what would be interesting to watch, and even things that don't make sense. Like Optimus knocks Megatron into like a wall of generators, and like he gets electrocuted, and he smiles mm-hmm. about it. <laughs> He's like, "Thanks for the power boost, Prime." And then he punches him. It's like, "Well, wait a minute. Why would that? Okay, I guess. But then why do you need energon cubes? Why not just like bump yourself into generators all the time?" <laughs> But it doesn't matter because it just looks cool. Because when he hits the wall and you see like the the lines that like are, define his body, like get all shaky, and he's laughing as everything gets all red and white, and it's kind of scary looking. Mm-hmm. And then he like comes into the shot to punch Optimus, and we see him from behind. We're looking up and behind him. It's a three quarter up shot, and so we don't even see his face, but we just see him like him kind of lurching over with like like this really powerful body. Like the pose is like coiled and ready to like strike. But then like just before he punches him, this flash of red electricity goes right over his whole body. It's like this quick one second thing. It's just so pretty and so well thought out and so dynamic. And when he when he's punching Optimus in the stomach, it just it feels like he's getting hit by a thousand trucks. You know. Mm. 
I don't even like violence that much in my adventure fiction, but I feel like if you're going to do it, do it beautifully. And they do it really, right. they do really imaginative, beautiful stuff in these battles between Optimus and Megatron in these first episodes. It's another one of those cases where it seems like this little scene went to a different art house and was yeah. animated by yeah. different people because immediately after the Prime and Megatron scene, the animation quality dips way back down. Yeah. At the moment Ironhide gets shot, it's like mm-hmm. Megatron's going to shoot Optimus. Oh, he he does the old move where he turns into a gun mode and hands himself over to a fellow Decepticon to shoot Optimus. Again, hinting that there's something about his gun mode that's even more powerful than his uh, forearm-mounted shoot, uh, fusion cannon, Yeah. right? If he turns into gun mode, like something else happens. That, that, that beam is so much more intense. And... Ironhide, who is Optimus's bodyguard, jumps in the line of fire, a la cheesy movie, and gets hit in the chest and falls down. And the Decepticons, like, after that, Megatron's like, okay, well, maybe this guy, oh, the rest of the Autobots show up, right? Prowl and Ratchet and everybody are there. So Megatron's like, well, we got what we want. Let's get out of here yep. and fly away. And Gears gets his third line in the entirety of the series so far. Megatron's getting away. But Ironhide's hurt bad. He's hurt mm. bad. So we got to get him fixed. So this is always the Autobots' weakness is that they care about each other. And so they have to get Ironhide back to base and repaired instead of going to stop Megatron. And it doesn't take long to get him home. And uh, Ironhide and... Or not, Ratchet and uh, Sparkplug are working on Ironhide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sparkplug has started to make himself useful by helping out Ratchet with repairing some stuff because he's good with a, a little wrench. Well, he says that rear end assembly looks like it used some old fashioned blowtorch work <laughs> to keep it from falling apart. Hey, oh, hey, oh. <laughs> Which, yes, 11 year old boys were like, ah, that's transgressive humor. That works for me. That's like George Carlin. <laughs> <laughs> but then we cut to Optimus and Prowl and Bumblebee and Spike are talking. Is that who's in the gathering? I think so. He's like, you know, we'll figure out what they're up to. Bumblebee, I want you to spy on the Decepticons. And this is his this is his job. He's yep. the Autobot spy. And this is the first time when Spike and Bumblebee ride anywhere together. So I yeah. guess th- their friendship's established pretty early on. Yeah. I mean, this is the first episode after the first miniseries. So I think yeah. I like to think that Spike saw Hound coming around the corner, so he's like, Oh, I'll go with Bumblebee. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Spike, want to go to a museum? Oh, no. <laughs> Bumblebee's like, I'll play video games with you. Okay, let's go. <laughs> so then we go back to the Decepticon base, and uh, Megatron and, and Shockwave are talking. So Shockwave has gotten on the phone with Megatron again, and he's showing off his plans for the space bridge. Uh, I guess he's uh, adding them as an attachment in Skype, like, hey, check out, check it out what I made. And he remarks that... Uh, they the are, space like, bridge... essentially Skyping. <laughs> mm-hmm. He remarks that the space bridge is basically a fast travel system between Earth and Cybertron. And he says, because the limitations of space bridge will only be open for 11 minutes. He doesn't say 11 billion astroseconds. He doesn't say 11 astroseconds. He says 11 minutes. I do really enjoy this aspect of the space bridge and how it works. I love that there's this physical limitation that even though it's essentially a teleporter, like, because all, this is my inference, okay? They mm-hmm. never say it in the, in the show, but because all heavenly bodies are moving all the time, mm. positions are all relative, and so there's only specific times where we're in the proper alignment to be able to do this fast transit system, and I can't control it. I right? like this that. Is something, I didn't think about yeah. that. I, I, I thought about it as something that is only, like, you can only use it, like, every certain amount of time i like that but i i never really thought of why that would be and again this is a great reason to do this podcast because it gets me thinking about the show in different ways and sometimes as as happened here you got me thinking about it in a different way that makes perfect sense like basically there's that tower thing that rises up from cybertron that uh, is part of the space bridge proper so i'm guessing like maybe cybertron has to be rotated towards earth yeah uh, yeah i mean that maybe it's line of sight yeah it's some kind of some kind of line of sight thing maybe not even that maybe it's something else maybe it's something to do with gravitational or solar tides right like there's like energy particles moving all throughout the cosmos all the time and i'm i'm speaking as somebody who co-wrote a graphic novel about the history and science of rockets right and like we had to learn a lot about how orbital mechanics work and like there's a lot of like 
counterintuitive things that come up when you start talking about traveling through space. Like, for instance, if you if you want to do like orbital rendezvous, like link up with another machine in orbit, it actually makes more sense to slow down than to speed up, because if you speed up, you increase the height of your orbit. And so then you'll you won't be able to link up with them. So if you slow down and wait for them to catch up with you, then you can link up like things like that. So it's like I think about like this, this from a writing perspective, this feels like it's just an artificial scarcity they added to the show to create a sense of tension. We have to hurry. Mm-hmm. We only have this, this this specific time slot when we can actually use the space bridge. Right. But. You know, it, you can you can rationalize a, a reasonable a reason why that would have to be, and that would have to do with the fact that they're so darn far apart, and there's probably lots of different kinds of things that could get between Earth and Cybertron, or they could be facing the wrong direction or whatever. But for whatever uh-huh. reason, you can only use the space bridge for a limited amount of time, and it's unpredictable when it's going to be open again. Shockwave has to constantly be watching this thing, and like, okay, Megatron, guess what? Space bridge is going to open. We're going to talk about that more in a second, but... Uh-huh. This is one of the real, I think, one of the really cool inventions of the series, like storytelling inventions, this this device that helped them get back and forth between Earth and Cybertron. So he's like, okay, Megatron, you, you got you to get me some Energon cubes pronto, but only get 11 minutes instead of astroseconds. They're at the space bridge when they're having this conversation, right? Or mm-hmm, no? Yeah, this, the Earth end of the space bridge has basically been built into this riverbed that, uh, as luck mm-hmm. would have it, Bumblebee and Spike happened upon so oh yeah it's because they're looking for shade they're like mm-hmm. oh it's kind of hot out here i don't see anything let's go into that riverbed for some shade and they see the decepticons a, a bridge to cybertron <laughs> and then they, they're testing out the space bridge and now we get to a iconic piece of animation that i love in this series is the space bridge transportation from earth to cybertron business right mm. the space bridge if you haven't seen it it's just like a giant circle made of a sort of uh, hex hexagonal donut, right? Does that sound yeah. right? Yeah. So on Cybertron, there's a tower that comes up and then it has a sort of cylindrical, what, what do you call those? Like those rotating restaurants in hotels. <laughs> it like has that kind of shape on the top. But then like it opens up like a flower, like these petals, metal petals open up and then like a purple beam comes in to feed in what was transported. But from Earth, there's this donut that's shaped like if it has six sides around it, so it's not a perfectly round in terms of the tube. And then there's a metal track that points to it, and then these two doors open in front of the donut, and you send the thing in, the doors close, and then all of a sudden, like this little tiny light opens up like maybe 75, 100 feet above the donut. And you hear like explosions and lightning, and all of a sudden, all this rock that's in the middle of the donut just like starts flying up into the air and going into that little tiny light, Mm -hmm. right? And then when... It sucks everything in, the light closes, and there's like a little flash, and then it explodes. <laughs> it explodes. <laughs> there's an explosion. Because why? Because you're literally transporting something into deep space from within Earth atmosphere, right? Like there's going to be like some crazy vacuum stuff going on. Um, and who knows what kind of power is being used to transport it that far. But it's it's a really cool piece of animation that makes the end of this episode that much more exciting, I think. But it's cool that we get that foreshadowing. Is they take a little spaceship, fill it full of energon cubes, put it in there. We get this awesome light show and all this like cool, sort of trippy, sucking rocks into outer space kind of animation. And then they get to Cybertron, and the flower petals open, the purple beam comes in, and the door opens in Shockwave's office, and there's nothing there. He's got nothing. So it's just the first test, though. It didn't work. But naturally, Starscream has to complain and say he would do a better job if he were in charge. <laughs> Yeah, like your space bridge is worthless. Oh my gosh, Starscream, stop. <laughs> like everybody in the Decepticons is tired of it by now. It's like, yeah, we know what you're going to say. You're going to say because Megatron screwed up that you would have done it better. Of course, that's very easy to say. <laughs> Starscream is the very first like online troll. <laughs> you're doing it wrong. Sign Starscream. <laughs> uh, Bumblebee and Spike are like, oh, we got we to gotta tell Optimus about this. And while they're having this discussion, Megatron's like, well, the ship just needs guidance. It only works because somebody needs to steer the ship uh, across the space bridge. Do I have any volunteers? And as he says that, who is it? Like, is Starscream, is it Starscream Thundercracker and Soundwave or Starscream Skywarp and Soundwave? I forget who the other Seeker is, but there's two Seekers in Soundwave. And when Megatron says, do I have any volunteers? Literally all three of them look away. (laughs) (laughs) Even Soundwave looks away. (laughs) 
Uh, and so then as Bumblebee's getting ready to leave, you hear Megatron say, I'll select a volunteer then. And then Bumblebee starts to drive, loses his footing, and slides down into the riverbed. And Megatron suddenly has his volunteer. Yeah. And that's our first act break, right? Mm-hmm. Commercial break time. So we come back from commercial break, and Megatron is putting Spike and Bumblebee inside the little pod to send them to Cybertron with the Energon cubes. And there's a creepy line from Starscream here. It's like, oh, yeah, you're going to go down in Cybertron history. You know? <laughs> I did like that line as a kid. It's like, oh, you, that's, that's so eerie that like you're trying to, you're jokingly trying to sweeten the pill, but in a way that suggests that you're enjoying the fact that they could die. <laughs> um, but then Megatron has to like ruin the joke by explain it. <laughs> it's like, oh, you're going to go down in Cybertron history, whether or not you make it across the space. But yeah, we know that's what Starsky was saying, Megatron. We got the joke. Don't ruin it. <laughs> but Megatron is too busy explaining jokes that he doesn't get Bumblebee and Spike into the little car on time. And because the space bridge is basically running on its own timeline, the second trial fails as well. So they don't they don't even get to try to go across. It's just test number two aborted. Then we get the bad news about how long it's gonna take till it's open again. When can the bridge be reopened? Three thousand astroseconds. Three thousand? This is intolerable. All right, the first go. use of astroseconds. <laughs> yes. I love astroseconds. Three thousand astroseconds. Okay, one. I love how playful it is. It's just the playful joining of words that don't belong together. What? It's space seconds? I mean, mm-hmm. astro means space or star, right? So it's like star seconds. It, it, it's, it's a silly conjunction of two words to create a fantasy word. But what I also love about it is that usually when astro seconds gets mentioned on this show, they always mention a lot of seconds. It's not mm-hmm. like in 25 astro seconds. It's because like one, would, one might come to the conclusion that an astro second would be longer than a second. Right. Because like a light year. Right. Mm. Uh, but no, it's like, it's just that because they're robots, they measure time to such a precise degree that a second is too big and vague of a concept. <laughs> you know, one earth second is too, it's too, it's like saying a week, you know, it's, it's just too broad a, a span of time. We need such precision that we measure in 18 billion astroseconds, you know, mm-hmm. So what time you got to get up tomorrow, Hound? Oh, well, I, about like 17 trillion astroseconds. Oh, okay. <laughs> get a good night's sleep. I, I don't know. I, I really, really love that, that playful aspect of the show. But I mean, in a show that l- largely doesn't have anything, I mean, it has a lot of whimsy, but I wouldn't call it humor. Mm-hmm. You know, it's nice to have at least something to grab onto that's silly. Yeah, so we have uh, Megatron and Shockwave talking on the phone, and Bumblebee uses this distraction to escape (laughs) and busts out of the little uh, space bridge car. So Soundwave launches Ravage to pursue. Yeah. Spike is running behind Bumblebee, so when Ravage actually pounces between them, Spike yells for Bumblebee to escape. Now... I want to make a note for the people listening to this that Hoover actually wrote this line in the notes because this is how well he knows me. Hoover There's no pauses notes. to listen. We, we know all this stuff. <laughs> yes, we just know everything off the top of our heads. No, he wrote this line, everybody. Hoover pauses to listen to Jersey go on about how brave Spike is. <laughs> yes, because <laughs> he is. And like I, I went through the same thing everybody went through, or at least a lot of young boys went through watching the show as children when we were like twelve and thirteen. We're like, Ugh, I hate the humans. I only want to be like the cool Autobots. <laughs> now, as an adult, I oh my gosh, I love Spike so much, and I love the fact that there is a mechanical jaguar standing in front of him with <laughs> missiles on its hips, and he, <laughs> and behind him are two talking jets, a really creepy tape deck, and a guy who could turn into a gun, you know? And yet, all he's thinking about is his friend, his friend Bumblebee. Bumblebee, get out of here. Don't worry about me. <laughs> and he says, wheel out, which is weird. Wheel out, what does that mean? It's like, trying to, you trying to make that a thing, Spike? Okay, <laughs> I don't think it's going to take. But <laughs> there's, there's a couple lines in this in the entire series that I feel like was somebody trying to turn something into a thing and it didn't take. <laughs> but yes, He's super brave, and he just wants his friend to be safe. And also, it makes sense. Bumblebee can go get help. So, but yeah, so like we always we always joke about Spike and Sparkplug going help, help, help. Not this time. This time, it's like Bumblebee, you get out of here. You go get help because uh, I'll I'll be fine. I'll take care of myself. Oh, 
Spike's so good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the Decepticons give chase to Bumblebee, and eventually they catch him, although for a small period of time, it looks like he's going to get away. But he doesn't. It, yeah, so. there's some nice animation here, too, where they're really trying to be ambitious with like a lot of camera movement. There's a lot of camera movement in this episode, where like when Laserbeak leaps out of Soundwave's chest, like we'll actually follow him, and he'll do like this sort of wheel around, and we wheel around with him mm-hmm. while he's transforming. In this scene, when Bumblebee's being shot at by Starscream and whichever other Seeker is there, it's not a, a static painted background. Like The whole landscape is animated as we're like following Bumblebee as he's twisting around corners, and the whole landscape is spinning. Mm-hmm. It's it's okay. It's again, it's not like, you know, the nine old men from Disney level animation, but it's it's trying more than what a cartoon of that era was doing. Yeah. And then Bumblebee hides in a cave and he chastises himself for leaving Spike behind, but he looks up and he sees a hole in the ceiling. He climbs up. Okay, I'll get out of here. And whoopsie. <laughs> he crawled right up to where the Decepticons were standing. And uh Starscream uses a familiar device on him. My Null Ray will stop your squirming for a while. Good work, Starscream! <laughs> so, it, he can't even accept a compliment from his boss, right? Good work, Starscream. What are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> and this is probably the first time in history Starscream has heard the Senate's good work, Starscream. Take the win. He can't take 10 astro seconds out of his life to enjoy the fact that he just heard that phrase from Megatron. He hates Megatron so much that he has to contradict him on every point. Good work, Starscream. No, it wasn't. (laughs) (laughs) I hate you, Dad. (laughs) (laughs) So clearly Uh, Starscream will never allow himself any shred of happiness, but at least he's referring to the Null Ray as his Null Ray now. Maybe that's why he was surprised that Megatron was there. He's like, I didn't want him to hear me say that. <laughs> <laughs> and then something weird happens. Like, this is like some of that like weird whimsy of the show that is like, they're sort of making it up as they go along. Yeah, the, I need something that I've never heard of before that will help us through this little plot device. Yeah, yeah. Like, we're going to change Bumblebee's memories somehow, which is, that's a reasonable thing to think you can do. They're robots, after all. So, clearly, they're going to have to, like, hook them up to Soundwave with some wires and run a machine and, you know, do a little bit of typing really fast like they do in movies. Uh, That's naturally what Megatron does, right? Or Megatron could just pull a little loose wire cord thingy out of his chest, which attaches to Bumblebee's noggin. Okay. Weird. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like a vacuum cleaner tube comes out of the Decepticon <laughs> symbol on his chest. And he sticks it on Bumblebee's head. It's a little known fact that all Decepticons have shop vacs built into them. Because <laughs> Megatron is just all about cleanliness. Cleanliness is next to godliness, Starscream. <laughs> get up. You'll get dirty. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> But Bumblebee, so like we get the transformer symbol transition, and then we see the Autobots back at base, and Sparkplug's worried about spikes. Like they they've been gone too long, and then Bumblebee shows up. Oh, uh, animation error. I don't know if we're keeping track of these, but like in the background, Cliff Jumper is colored yellow, so it's mm-hmm. like weird. Like it's like where's Bumblebee? Like he's right behind. Oh no, it's Cliff Jumper. <laughs> Cliff Jumper's like fooled you. But then Bumblebee shows up, and he's like he tells them like the Decepticons captured Spike. They're gonna send him across the space bridge. And uh, Optimus is like, well, where is this space bridge? So Bumblebee uh, tells them where the space bridge is. He's like, the space bridge, the space yes. bridge is yeah. in a cave. <laughs> and everyone's like, yeah, okay, so- checks out. <laughs> yeah, I get what they're doing there. They're trying to let the kids know. It's like, okay, he's telling a lie, you know, and he doesn't know he's lying. And the Autobots are getting false information. But because like otherwise I could see like a young kid being confused like why would Bumblebee lie to them that's not worth the space bridge is so they make him do this halting voice uh, yes Spike is there too <laughs> Bumblebee's never wrong Prime so and by the way Megatron is really powerful and awesome <laughs> and Starscream is the worst <laughs> <laughs> now that would have been see that would have been a good joke they would have put in one of the later series like I could see that happening in Transformers animated mm-hmm. right yeah <laughs> Especially if Starscream did it instead of Megatron. Yeah, yeah, it totally would have. And then so 
Optimus says the iconic line. Now it's cemented. Now it's for real. For the first time, we hear Prime say... No Transformer rollout, huh? He just says roll out. Huh. We're inching ever closer to that transform and roll out catchphrase. It's better than let's get out of here. When you, wor- <laughs> when you workshop these things, you got to go through a period of trial and error. Let's get out of here. Didn't work so well. <laughs> gotta go. That didn't work. <laughs> There was there was maybe a, a brief window of time where I said, see ya, wouldn't want to be ya. <laughs> Smell you later. That didn't work out so great. <laughs> Alpha try and just like clicked his tongue at him. Like, no, no, no. So we see as, as they're leaving, Laserbeak was there listening the whole time and he flies back to base. And now we see something brand new that we've never seen before, but we will see a lot in the series from here on. A tower rises out of the sea coming from the crashed Decepticon ship underneath the water, and that becomes their new way of getting into the ship so they don't have to just splash down in the ocean. And unlike when Ravage was in tape mode reporting through Soundwave, when Laserbeak pops into Soundwave's tape deck and he's like, Laserbeak, report, he just plays back what Optimus says. Mm -hmm. So... Laserbeak does not have a talking voice. <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny if it did, though? Like, blah, the Autobots are... <laughs> blah, 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 blah. <laughs> shut it off, shut it off! All right, I got it, I got it. <laughs> Maybe that was what happened originally, and Megatron's like, just, just play what you heard. <laughs> just tell us what you overheard. <laughs> we'll, we'll get enough of that with Polly on season two of G.I. Joe. <laughs> So he's like, all right, well, we'll be ready for them when they go to this cave. And they get to the cave. The Autobots get to the cave. And, you know, there's no space bridge. There's no nothing. And Bumblebee's like, I don't understand it. I know it's here. Yep, so Gears sasses him in his fourth line in the series. Good old grumpy (laughs) Gears, always ready for a chance to complain about Bumblebee. So why are you counting all of Gears' lines, by the way? He's about to disappear. You know, there's so many Autobots and so many Decepticons they aren't all going to stick around for very long. I mean, the rest of the season, there's only a total of 16 episodes, including the first miniseries. So Mm -hmm. Gears is one of those guys who's about to sort of disappear into the background until (laughs) one lone episode in season two. But uh, One great episode. I mean, in my mind, before we started this podcast, Gears had like one line before (laughs) his episode in season two. But so... I'm finding he had more than one. He's he's had four so far, so let's give him that. When these episodes aired, I don't remember if they were airing them in sequential order. And that's another thing worth noting is that this this mm. first season, there feels like there's a sequence in there. Like there's a sequential order to watch them in, which kind of gets dropped by season two. Mm-hmm. Season two, it's like you can bip in and out anywhere for the most part. Yeah. But in this, they're they're building a lot of new stuff. So there is an order to watch it. But I remember, I, I, I remember seeing Fire in the Sky before I saw this one. Mm. And in Fire in the Sky, Gears has one line. And I remember as a kid going, like, who's that guy? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like he has one little, like, we better fight Optimus. And then it's like, okay, well, who is that weird guy? That's <laughs> I, with the egg, egg-shaped head. I don't understand. But yeah, so Gears, he's on borrowed time at this point. So <laughs> Hoover's being, he's making fun of him, but he's being respectful to this poor guy who gets shunted to the background. <laughs> and so, you know, this smells like a trap. Oh, it is. And the Decepticons show up and just start shooting up the place. Is this the next act break? Yep. Now we get another, there's silly elements to this this battle scene, but it's another relatively imaginative battle scene. It's like we're actually getting a sense of play a little bit in this series. Like when Jazz shows up and grabs the stalagmite and turns into a baseball bat to like hit Starscream's laser back at him. <laughs> <laughs> like for some reason when Starscream's laser hits the stalactites and stalagmites behind him, they explode. But when it hits Jazz's bat, it just deflects maybe it's something about an angle i don't know but and there's that weird business where optimus's foot like for no reason gets stuck in a rock <laughs> <laughs> my foot it's stuck it's like iron Hide's trying to help him pull his leg out <laughs> and then like megatron's like ah well i'll i'll cut you down to size or whatever and like his hand goes into his forearm and out comes a little like spinning saw that he like throws yeah like, a, a disc We've never seen this before, and spoiler alert, we'll never see it again, I don't think. (laughs) Now, see, now I wonder if any of the Masterpiece toys come with the saw hand. 
because like I they all come with so. the, the purple mace but do they they get to my favorite wrist weapon the <laughs> saw hand <laughs> But like it, the saw like flies out and it just like sort of bounces around, yeah. like 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 a Mario fireball, <laughs> <laughs> and then like it it hits the rock where Optimus's foot is, and then he just like falls off to the side. <laughs> Doesn't really do anything, but it does create a cool effect. Cause it create like it, it grinds up a bunch of rock and fills the room with like dust, so that Me- Megatron can't see Optimus, right? Mm-hmm. And then while, so like while they're looking for each other in the haze, all of a sudden Megatron's cell phone goes off. Yeah, a shockwave calls Megatron on Megatron's little belly button phone because a little light is going off around where the belly button would be. And yeah. he tells them that the space bridge is about to open. Well, there blows my whole theory about them having a precise measurement of time because Megatron just let the 33,000 astro minutes just go by <laughs> without noticing. <laughs> well, when you're in a battle shooting off little saw blades at your enemy, time just flies. And, and like, there's a real urgency. Like, Shockwave's like, I repeat, it's yeah. about to open. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, in case the first two test failures didn't uh, put this idea in your head, we're operating on a time schedule here. You don't need to be yeah. off battling Optimus Prime right now. You need to be at the Space Bridge, which is across town. <laughs> <laughs> this, again, like, this is the only instances where we ever see Megatron ever being responsive and sort of uh, obedient to anything right mm. he's like it's about to open he's like all right we'll be there you know yep. he's like, he's like drop everything everybody let's just get out of here starscream time to retreat but of course megatron has to leave the autobots a little uh, going away present so he caves in the cave by blasting it and assuming the cave-in has killed all the autobots because that's how they operate in this series. Uh, once they create a cave-in and <laughs> someone's in there, they just assume they're defeated. Just like whenever anyone splashes down into the ocean, they assume they're yeah. defeated and dead. It's just a lot of uh, Transformer assumptions here. Th- th- that's an evolutionary trait of Cybertronians is the out of sight, out of mind. <laughs> oh, they're dead. Let's see if they were. Like, every time Bumblebee comes home, Optimus is like, you're alive! <laughs> well, yeah, of course I am. <laughs> but you were just, I didn't see you. And you were <laughs> you were dead. That's uh, that's why the robots in disguise aspect is such a such a uh, powerful thing. It's like they transform into something else and then they're suddenly not there. <laughs> Where'd it go? <laughs> Well, Soundwave was here for a second ago, but now all I see is a lamppost. <laughs> but yeah, it's like it's like somebody should have whispered to Megatron, uh, dude, Ruby Crystals of Burma. Remember that? <laughs> that didn't kill you. Yeah, but we're indestructible. Oh, I see. Okay. They're not indestructible. Fine. So they go back to, uh, or they leave to go to the space bridge, and then Bumblebee has been injured, and Ratchet comes up to him and says, all right, I'm going to help fix you. And then he realizes upon, while he's performing his repairs, that Bumblebee's memory chips have been altered. And so he resets him. Resets the PRAM on Bumblebee. And he's, he's like, where's the space bridge? He's like, the cave. I mean... <laughs> it's in the riverbed. Let's go to the riverbed. Oh, but aren't we caved in, Optimus? Yeah, just shoot it. And they shoot the wall. <laughs> yeah, but we have these cannons here. <laughs> oh, we're, we're out now. <laughs> Remember what the Decepticons did? We'll just do that. <laughs> So they get to the riverbed, and there's a nice scene here where um, Spike is in the spaceship or the little pod getting ready to be sent over, and Megatron is describing what Spike's going to do, right? Mm -hmm. He's like, you'll be riding on a beam of light. Focus on that beam, or you'll be lost in the cold void and cease to exist. I realize as an adult watching, he's talking about, oh, well, if you fall off the beam, you'll just get lost in deep space and then suffocate or Mm -hmm. you know starve to death whichever comes first but how true Um, is it because i mean i mean is this a detail that that shockwave has given megatron on one of their calls because it's like how does megatron suddenly know this weird aspect to the space bridge yeah i i just i really like that he describes it instead of shows it right because they could have easily like pulled the monitor over and be like see this here's how it's gonna work Mm -hmm. you know but because he describes it it left it up to and like Again, I'm I'm here I am advocating for creative people. Never underestimate a kid's imagination. They're always going to imagine something way weirder than you can show them. Mm. So when he said that line, what I had in my head is not what you had in your head. It's not what another kid had in their head, right? They're all going to come up with their own sort of freaky imagining of Spike's ending mm-hmm. when Megatron's describing it. So there are times where it's better to tell than show, and I think this was a really, really good time to do that. He's basically telling Spike to follow the gleam of light or you're going to die. Yeah, yeah. 
And he says the cold, dark void, and you'll cease to exist. What? What does that even mean? That's freaky, you know? And and the fact that, I mean, Megatron wants the thing to succeed, right? He, he wants the cubes to get there, so that's why he's telling Spike, be mindful, do a good job, you know? Uh, I, I really don't care if you live or die, but the fact that the warning is coming from... If the devil warns you of something, mm. holy cow, does that seem scary, right? Yeah. So, yeah, that scene hung with me. And then the Autobots arrive. Bumblebee's like, well, I got him into this. I'm going to get him out of it. And I, I do like this scene very much when Optimus is like, I'll assist you. And he adjusts the cannon, his laser gun, and he does like some sharpshooting. He like does a little pew pew. And then like the, the canopy opens on the ship while Spike's riding along towards the space bridge. And he shoots out both of the harnesses holding Spike's shoulders in without hurting Spike. <laughs> it's a good thing that wasn't Cliff Jumper doing that. <laughs> I'll get him out, Prime. <laughs> uh, no! <laughs> and he hits Hound in the face. He hits Iron Hide in the foot. <laughs> Cliff Jumper, we're getting you glasses. <laughs> We're stopping at Lens Crafters on the way home. <laughs> but I wanted sexy specs. All right, so they uh, then Spike jumps on Bumblebee and they drive away. The pod, now without a pilot, like it's kind of spins out and the Energon cubes all fall on the ground. Megatron, who hates <laughs> dirtiness, <laughs> as we've established in this episode, runs over. It's like, I got to get those cubes to Cybertron. And he scoops them up and runs into the space bridge to throw him in. But then what happens? Did somebody shoot at him or something? Yeah, he sharp, gets, like, sharp shooting in? Optimus Prime basically shoots him into the little uh, space bridge donut-shaped portion. And the space bridge goes, okay, it's time to transport. <laughs> hey, there's something in here. Time to go. <laughs> and then, yeah, then the eerie thing happens with, like, the sky gets dark and the clouds form, and then a the little pinpoint of light appears above the space mm-hmm. bridge, and we see... The rocks start flying up towards the hole, and we look down in the space bridge. We see Megatron laying on his back, and he's spinning around yep. like all over the place, like flat on his back. Right? He's not tumbling. It's like he's like pinned to the ground somehow, but then like flipping all over the place. Mm-hmm. For a split second, we see him in the rubble going into the light, and then the light closes, and the explosion happens, and then Starscream walks into the shot. <laughs> <laughs> oh man this this is perfect this is perfect <laughs> star scream megatron's gone for two astro seconds well we can't see him anymore so we yeah. have to assume <laughs> megatron is out of the line of sight therefore star scream is the leader now but this is the only time i think that we ever hear star scream say megatron is dead like it, it, there's a lot of other lines where he says Megatron has fallen, you know, mm-hmm. Me- Megatron is gone, you know, Megatron's been is no more. But like I remember as as a kid, you didn't hear the word death very often in kids cartoons. So that right. shocked me too. Like, whoa, is he really dead? Holy cow, Megatron is dead. That happens in cartoons? You can't do that. I've watched G.I. Joe. There's a parachute every time. <laughs> but nope, Megatron is dead. But then Starscream is so excited about this that he made a clone of himself to stand by him while he made the announcement, right? Yeah, one of those animation errors where it's like, well, let's make two Starscreams on the screen rather than Thundercracker or Skywarp. But it's possible that this was changed for the final version because these 2B versions are the original versions of the show before some of the changes got put in. So, like, mm. if you look at the Shout Factory DVDs, those have the fixed versions. So I haven't compared and contrast to see if this is oh. a mistake that lasted, you know, through all the iterations of the process. But uh, could very well be because a lot of uh, mistakes did uh, just basically get stuck in there. Memory is a funny thing. I don't fully trust mine, but I seem to remember having this episode on VHS at my parents' video store. Mm. And I think I remember that animation error being on the VHS tapes. Mm, okay. I, I could be wrong, but I seem to remember having this conversation with other fellow Transformers friends about like, what the heck? Why is there two star screams? <laughs> but yeah, at, at, at the very least, the important thing is that if Megatron leaves the room, the first thing star is going to do is is announced to everybody else that he is in charge. Yeah, that definitely became a running joke with you and me for quite some time. 
<laughs> I mean, later on, Megatron's going to fall down, and he says, I'm the leader. <laughs> That's not many episodes away, but like that that's 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 just what a hair trigger he's got for making this announcement. <laughs> it's like it's like it's it's just it's constantly churning in his head. I'm the leader now, I'm the leader now, I'm the leader now. And then as soon as Megatron's gone, he just shouts it. It's almost like it's like a like a vomit. It just comes out of him. <laughs> that's why you never see Megatron take any bathroom break in the series because he's afraid what Starship's gonna do in his absence. That's right. Yeah. Remember that time I went to visit my parents? Oh yeah. <laughs> Starscream, he, man, he wrecked up the place. So they, so Starscream's like, I'm in charge now. Let's get out of here. And they fly away. And then we cut to the Autobots who are all happy. And Bumblebee says, this is the happiest day of my life. <laughs> Megatron got killed by his own space bridge. He's lost forever. But Optimus is no longer John Wayne Optimus. He's quiet, methodical Optimus. He wishes he could believe that. It, this is a nice shot too. I want to artist advocacy moment. He the the shot of Optimus is he says, "I wish I could believe that." It's a three quarter up shot, and it's a really cool looking shot of him of Optimus looking up at the sky, and then the camera pans up, and then we see outer space, and then we see Cybertron. Nice transition because we're showing Optimus is thinking about Megatron. He knows mm-hmm. he's out there. Where is he? Here he is. And then we go to Shockwave's office, and the doors open from the Space Bridge Tower. And he's like, Megatron. And I love the way he delivers the slides. He's like, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> he's so sad. <laughs> he's the opposite of Starscream in that way, right? It's like Starscream's like, ah, you failed, didn't you? What is it with you and failure, you <laughs> failure? And the shock was like, oh, my heart is broken. You had a plan and it didn't work. Do you, do you need anything? Can I get you a, a blanket, a hug? I'm so sad that you're sad. What happened? And after four million years, Shockwave is face to face with Megatron and just overcome with emotion. He's so verklempt. <laughs> and then Megatron does this weird thing where he's like, he he sounds really tired. First of all, he's like, oh, they cheated me in my victory. But then he like points up at the sky, like he like sticks his arm out and points straight ahead. It's like, but you know, revenge will be mine or whatever. He's like, you know, I'll make them pay. And his eyes glow at the end. But like, what's he pointing at? <laughs> The episode ends here because like a lot of these episodes ends with Megatron making some kind of threat. I'll be mm-hmm. back. Yeah. I'll be avenged. And then it goes to black. What do you think happened right after the, the screen went to black? Well, I mean, Megatron told Shockwave, you know, it's you're in charge, buddy. And Shockwave was like, Cybertron will remain as you leave it. So he's probably just showing them. Here, Megatron. Here's here's your old room. It's just as you left it. Uh, got the got all the punk rock posters up still. One of them tried oh. to fall down, but I put it right back up, just like you left it. You still like nine inch nails, right? You still like nine inch nails. Well, I left it up there. Uh, you remember that park you used to go to? It's still there. It's still there. I'll take you there. We'll drive by. I'll tell you all about it. it hasn't changed a bit. There was some graffiti from some female Autobots, but I cleaned it off. It's right now. It's just as you left it, I promise. <laughs> now, see, I can get behind the fanon where Megatron is just tired of a fawning shockwave more than I can of Optimus being disgusted with his fellow Autobots. <laughs> you remember that restaurant on 3rd and 4th? The one you really, really like to go to? It's still there. It's still there. I made sure they still prepare your favorite thing. Ugh. They were going to change the menu, but I said no. <laughs> <laughs> Megatron wouldn't like that. They said he's gone. I said he's not. He's coming back. <laughs> I just can't tell you how great it is to have you back. Ugh, I gotta get back to Earth. <laughs> this is why. Yeah, this is this is our our speculation. This is why Megatron spends so much time on Earth and then the rest of the season. <laughs> it's not unlike in Transformers Animated when Lugnut gets a little too uh, fawny over Megatron. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Well, and then this gets repeated even funnier with Inferno and Beast Wars, right? Where he's like, as you command, my queen. Oh, I wish he wouldn't call me that. (laughs) So, yeah, this is a fun. This is the first place where we really start to see that happen. But it's a fun thing that gets repeated later on in the series. So Uh, any other 10,000 foot up takeaways of this episode? Yeah. it's it's enjoyable. I like it. it. I wouldn't say it's an absolute favorite, but uh, it's got enough cool aspects to it. I love that Shockwave's brought back in 
you know, it's first appearance of a space bridge. So, I mean, if this were a comic book, it'd be worth more money. <laughs> but uh, overall, it's very very enjoyable episode, I think. Yeah, and it's it's it sets off a lot of firsts that become sort of staples of the series from here on out. Mm-hmm. So I, I have a feeling like future episodes will be a little bit shorter because we won't have to cover so much about like, well, now we know what the space bridge is and now we know how the relationship between Megatron and Shockwave is. In, and how Shockwave becomes sort of like their remote guy on Cybertron while they do operations on Earth. And Optimus is always tired and sad now instead of being <laughs> kind of spunky and resourceful. <laughs> yeah. He's even too tired and sad to get angry at anyone. <laughs> That's right. Oh, I wish I could believe that. Oh, if only life were like that. All right. Well, okay. So what, what's the next episode? What do you want to look forward to? Next episode is Roll For It. Oh, a good one. This is one of my favorites. And I think in the next one we get to meet Chip Chase. <laughs> oh, <Courage>. my gosh. <laughs> oh, who I love even more than Spike. Oh, I can't wait to talk about Chip Chase with you. And it, <laughs> it has one of my very favorite scenes in a Transformers episode of all time. So look forward to that next week on the 4 Million Years Later podcast. Until next time, I have been Jersey Drozd of 4millionyearslater.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I have been Hoover, either from the past or the future. But he has real feelings, folks. So send him a nice message. <laughs> e- email, email address is coming up. Okay, bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Episode synopses are from imdb.com and some episode information taken from tfwiki.net. Closing theme is by Nick Mahalik, based on the original closing theme by Ford Kinder and Ann Bryant. You can find more of Nick's music at soundcloud.com slash nicholas Mahalik. That's spelled N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S dash M-E-H-A-L-I-C-K. Find us on Facebook under 4 Million Years Later, and you can email us at 4 Million Years Later at gmail.com. Visit 4millionyearslater.com, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. You know how it works. <laughs>